invitation. Thanks for having us, Tracy. Glad to be here, Alexander. <laughs> I'd really like to know, first of all, how did this journey towards researching case formulation start? What drew you and your interest into it? Well, as I think back, uh, it uh, I'd say it started with my graduate studies at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. I ended up doing a uh, single case study dissertation, which, as you could imagine, is pretty unusual. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, I went on to do a postdoc at UC San Fran University of California, San Francisco, working with uh, Marty Horowitz there. And he had developed a case formulation method, which he called uh, configurational analysis and I did a just a very large amount of work with him that focused on uh, on this area and uh, you know it just sort of continued from there yeah yeah, yeah. and it, did you feel at the time that case formulation was in any way anyway undervalued or understudied well it's clearly understudied uh, and um, I think that it uh, May you know while a lot of the you could read literature and people will certainly write that case formulation is important. One thing we learned early on is that people it's sort of a it was sort of a mystery. People didn't quite know what was meant by the term case formulation or case conceptualization, mm -hmm. and there were different views from different schools ranging from uh, from uh, you know it's the role of the clinician to sort of determine. Uh, independently without collaboration with the patient necessarily what the formulation is to highly collaborative models and the approach that I have always felt is uh, is the more appropriate one and is clearly the consensus today is that case formulation is a product of a collaboration between the uh, the clinician the therapist and the and the client or patient and I might add one other uh, you know, point to what I said earlier in response to your first question about my interest. I would just say I've always had a, kind of an interest in the, the individual, the individual psychotherapy patient. I've always just believed that you know, you know, we read rec important research about, um, about uh, psychotherapy outcome and processes that are done in a context of you know, comparing one group against a, another group, random assignment and so forth, and it will tell you, you, you learn outcomes about the average patient, but each of us as uh, therapists meets with individual patients, and we're trying to solve one by one individual patient problems, and, and that's what's intrigued me, and I, you know, I continue a, a regular psychotherapy practice on top of uh, the other things that I do. And you also collaborate a lot with the Journal of Pragmatic Case Studies, so it makes total sense, right? Yeah. That's a great online journal if uh, some of the listeners are not uh, aware of that. Uh, that's uh, Fishman's, uh, the editor of, of, of that. It's, a, it's an outstanding uh, a case formulation journal that, that uh, takes a very evidence-based, uh, disciplined approach uh, uh, to understanding individual patients. I totally agree. I already had the pleasure of talking to Stan Messer a little bit about Excellent. The, yeah, Excellent. Yeah. And it really is a, a great effort, I think. But, but yep. uh, what you're saying ties in with something I want to ask, because when you edited the two editions of Handbook of Psychotherapy Case Formulation, it's mm -hmm. interesting that different chapters, of course, were from therapists of different approaches. And, right. you know, being from different approaches, they have different ideas of what's the cause of the problem, how to formulate, right. etc. But having said that, we need some common criteria for evidence-based case formulation, something that ties right. it all in. I know you've, of course, been very interested in this topic, so what do you now feel right. are the constituted as the appropriate evidence for a case formulation? Well, <clears throat> I guess I think of evidence on a continuum, all right? Uh, you know, evidence can range, and the continuum would be uh, uh, the quality of the evidence. So at one end, you might have evidence that maybe it's not particularly uh, uh, reliable or you have questions about the validity of it. And at the other end, you might have quite a bit of uh, research evidence supporting it. You know, I clearly favor one end of the of the of the uh, continuum over the other, the evidence-based end, 
So, you know, I would, you know, put at that uh, end um, psychotherapy outcome studies. I would say process outcome research. I, I, I also think that we uh, have learned a great deal uh, uh, from uh, psychometrics. So I would put psychological test uh, findings maybe at that category in that, you know, and of course, you know, patient disclosure is the kind of evidence as well. Mm -hmm. We have to take patient disclosure, particularly disclosures about events that have taken earlier uh, in their life, including at the very earliest uh, points of their life that they can recall with a bit of a grain of salt because we know a lot from research on memory that that memory can be can be faulty. You know, I also think that research outside of strictly the psychotherapy domain can be helpful too. So psychopathology research can be helpful. Epidemiological research can be helpful. I just uh, finished a course on formulation with uh, psychiatry residents here at uh, University of Louisville, and I illustrate this point by saying, you know, I, I just ask, you know, is it useful? to know uh, if you're trying to uh, formulate a case or reach a diagnosis, to know that the base, ra and, and the patient is telling you that they, the source of their problems is uh, they were victims of satanic ritual abuse, okay? And this is a real example from many years ago in my clinical practice. You know, is it useful to know that based on the best evidence, and there's not a whole lot of evidence on this, that uh, you know, the base rate of satanic ritual abuse is probably three out of 10,000 people at most, you know, as opposed to something like uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, which has much higher base rates. And to me, that, that makes the obvious point that you're going to uh, tilt initially toward the, uh, you know, the, the diagnosis of the problem with the higher base rate, yeah. which isn't to say that... Um, we need to be respectful of the patient's understanding of their own, uh, uh, you know, experience. We have to be respectful of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you, you were talking about bridging here the fields, and I really want to ask you more about this because it really interests me. Sometimes you also tie in with cognitive science, the work of people like Daniel right. Kahneman. Just a, a little bridge just before we talk about that. I think it could be important just for you to state more explicitly what you think are the main goals of a case formulation? Well, the main goals of a formulation are to develop a hypothesis about what is causing the patient's problems, what's maintaining them, and uh, how one can uh, use that understanding to develop a treatment plan that will help the patient as quickly and efficiently as one can. So a case formulation is a tool and it's a tool that develops uh, as one continues in uh, therapy with the person. It's not, a, it's not a static object. So the goals again are to facilitate a positive treatment outcome. Mm -hmm. Based on the best evidence at the time. Right. If I were to like summarize it very briefly, that's how I would I would say. There are other benefits too. I mean I think that it uh, you know, it, uh, it, it helps a therapist develop empathy because to the extent that you can understand the patient through a formulation, you're going to, uh, you know, feel more empathic toward the patient. And we know empathy predicts outcome. Uh, it, uh, you know, it, it helps the therapist be consistent from one session to the next. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, it kind of helps the, the therapist by providing a kind of organizational framework for for uh, for their therapy interventions, it's so interesting because when people think of case formulation, sometimes they think of a more colder uh, diagnostic process. And what you just said speaks to me to a more humanistic level. It's like if I can make an appropriate case formulation, I can better be in the shoes of my client and exactly. develop better empathy. It's not a cold process at all. It's a it's a very warm process. <laughs> it's an interactive, and I I will I, I I will again emphasize as I said earlier, you know the best formula an effective formulation 
must absolutely must be developed out of a collaboration with the with the, uh, the the patient or the client it does little good if the therapist has a wonderful formulation even if it's in some sense accurate uh, if the 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 patient does not uh, is not willing to entertain it and, and accept it yeah so so in a general sense you think that of course this is co-constructed and shared with the client very well said yes absolutely and, and is there a, it's not just shared it well you just said the earlier point co-constructed, co-constructed yeah right is there yeah, any... The therapist has to be flexible. It, you know, the therapist may have to give up their sort of, if you will, you know, preferred or pet understanding of a of a explanation in favor of a of uh, of uh, the the patients. That's not to say that uh, you know there's one person in the room who's the expert mm-hmm. and uh, the expert in psychotherapy, and that's the patient. The other person in the room is also an expert on their life, <laughs> and that's the patient. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is there? You know, a- and we know, we know from. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, please. I was just going to say we know uh, from uh, research too that uh, the largest contributor to outcome in psychotherapy is the patient. Mm-hmm. So, you know, all the more reason to. Um, uh, collaboratively co-construct, as you say, the, the formulation. And is there any uh, situations you might think of that it would be unadvisable to share a case formulation with the client? Um, <clears throat> I think that um, a, a, uh, sometimes a, I mean it depends as the answer to a lot of our questions. Sure. I think you know sometimes a formulation may be too strong a medicine, if you will, for a patient at a given point in time. That said, I think part of the task of the therapist is to present information uh, or present the formulation in a way that uh, uh, is responsive to Kind of where the patient's coming from at a given at a given point in time. So it's all, it's sort of all in how it's how it's done. Yeah. So you know, and again, the the you know the I think another point is to this is not an intellectual exercise. Yeah. Uh, so one's not you know simply providing as you know a, a sort of a cold analysis of what's causing the person's uh, problems and maintaining them. It's. Uh, it's it's uh, you know the formulation is a way to enhance the alliance with the patient and if it um, uh, damages the alliance then the therapist can know that uh, you know, they you know need to repair that alliance and think about maybe revising the formulation and presenting it in a different way. Another kind of piece of this that I haven't really mentioned that 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 I want to. St- add in is that uh, feedback is critical in uh, testing the formulation. I think that, you know, progress monitoring and doing this in a uh, empirical, regular, frequent, that is frequent way is uh, essential in this uh, process. Are you speaking of like the feedback systems for people like Mike Lambert developed? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now he's got a system, the OQ45, that I think is wonderful. You know that it does, uh, but there are there there are many other systems out there that um, that people can use. Mm -hmm. I'm really enjoying that we're able to connect a lot of the case formulation to other research right now. So from what you said, it can improve, of course, the alliance. It can improve therapist empathy, which is very interesting. I never thought about that, and. Of course, we also know that goal consensus and task consensus is also a major part. Yeah. Absolutely. You're right. Mm-hmm. Great. So, okay, let's jump into the cognitive science we we're talking about. So, okay. I know that you wrote a little bit about the mixture between research of uh, psychotherapy and cognitive science. So, I- I'm tempted to ask you, how does thinking fast and slow influence <laughs> our, uh, our case formulation skills? Well, so you know the the work of D- Daniel Daniel Kahneman has uh, has uh, affected uh, uh, many different fields, and increasingly we are uh, 
uh, learning and thinking about how it affects uh, the field of psychotherapy. And you know, we know from his work and others in this area that uh, you know we are flawed thinkers. You know, the, even the best of us make systematic uh, errors in uh, clinical judgment. We know that in uh, some uh, contexts, uh, not necessarily psychotherapy, that you know, uh, formulas, if you will, regression formulas, uh, do a better job at uh, pre making predictions than individual clinicians. And you know, that's a diff diff difficult pill sometimes for the clinician to swallow, but if you look at the research, I think we have to accept it. At the same time, there are certain um, uh, contexts where clinical judgment is just simply part and parcel of what we do, and psychotherapy is part of that. The clinician is making judgments all the time on a moment-to-moment -moment basis in uh, psychotherapy. The way I I often will begin a conversation about case formulation with students. I will ask them, how do you know what to do next in therapy? So, you know, imagine yourself in a the consultation room. You're meeting with the patient. Maybe it's your first meeting. Maybe it's your 10th or your 12th or what, 20th or whatever. The patient is doing something. The clinician is faced with the question, what do I do next? And uh, that involves judgment. Um, <clears throat> I think the formulation helps answer that question of what to do next. Mm -hmm. But we want to keep in mind uh, research that uh, informs us about potential errors in judgment we can make. You know, and these include things like, uh, you know, confirmation bias. Uh, uh, and, you know, we. we you know, just simply because uh, you know the, the a patient provides us information that confirms maybe the formulation does not necessarily mean that another formulation or another view is also valid or may provide a better explanation. Mm -hmm. So that would be one, and uh, I think we have to be suspect of our intuitive judgments too. That's because our intuitive judgments sometimes can be subject to these systematic flaws in, in judgment, you know, particularly in the intense sort of uh, uh, atmosphere of, of affect that can arise in, um, in psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. So when, I th you know, I did write a chapter on, I think something called it something like sound judgment in case formulation. Mm -hmm. And it lays out a number of these biases that that we're all subject to, and uh, offers some tips on how to uh, you know try to get uh, get around these. And it also has a section on when intuition can be useful, because uh, there there is some research to show that um, in certain contexts intuition can be uh, valid and uh, accurate. Can you speak a little bit more about this? What distinguishes, sure. yeah, uh, let's call it uh, appropriate intuition or uh, healthy intuition? <laughs> well, I would say when, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, when the atmosphere, the context, uh, the environment in which um, the judgment is being made is, is, if you will, kind of a friendly environment when it's conducive to accurate clinical judgment um, is rather than what some have described a kind of a wicked environment where, where uh, you know, one might be um, where the, the context itself is one that can lead one to, to err. So, for example, outside of psychotherapy, the you know, the context of trying to predict a stock prices is not a particularly friendly environment because, uh, um, you know, there I'm no expert in that area, but 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 it's it's one where one's trying to make long-term judgments. Often there's there's huge amounts of data, but we don't have we don't have 
ways to understand that data particularly well. In psychotherapy, one makes uh, often short-term judgments where one can get feedback pretty immediately from the, from the patient on whether that judgment uh, you know, resonates with the person or not. Mm -hmm. So you make an intervention, you, you offer, say, a formulation or a piece of a formulation, and you look at how the uh, patient responds to what you've said. Mm -hmm. That's feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, and when, that's one form of feedback. The progress monitoring uh, uh, aspect of formulation can be helpful too. So if you use some symptom checklist of some kind uh, that uh, that you, which I do, I, re I do this with every session I review and I look at whether you know whether the symptoms are increasing or decreasing or staying the same. Mm -hmm. If they're staying the same or increasing, that's feedback, and that that can be helpful to me in my uh, in my intuitive uh, judgments, if you will. But I think even in the best of circumstances, one wants to think uh, treat intuition carefully. I would not be one to say that. By any means, we we should disregard our intuitive judgments because often, you know, we uh, were we have no choice but to rely on those in the rapid sort of give and take of of, of psychotherapy. We just have to be uh, develop a kind of an expertise in uh, uh, developing uh, sound, uh, if you will, if it's not a contradiction of terms, evidence based. Intuitions, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because as you said, I hope that's responsive to your question. That is, that is a good response because it's interesting that, uh, like you said, in the clinical setting, the decision making is quite fast. So, uh, you would see, I would imagine, case formulations as sort of roadmap that you're constantly re reconfiguring through the feedback of the client. Right. Okay. Right, and then to the extent that the therapist is aware of the the huge amount of research that can impact what happens in the session yeah. uh, and uh, that deep knowledge base is going to uh, hone a therapist's intuition and that's the value of of, of course graduate studies it's the value of uh, reading your journals it's the value of staying up to date on on the research. Yeah, and in 2005, you published an article comparing the quality of case formulations between expert and uh, novice therapists. Can you mm -hmm. tell us what main things differences you found? Well, <clears throat> uh, yes. One of the things we 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 found some strong differences between expert case formulators. And both novice case formulators, who in this case were not entirely novices, they were like say third-year graduate students. Okay. These were re relative to their their peers, still uh, more experienced, uh, uh, so they weren't entirely new to psychotherapy. We compared the experts with the novices. We also compared the experts with experienced psychotherapists, people who were out in the field who had had at least 10 years of, of clinical practice. And our case formula, our experts were both experienced and were folks who had, um, say, written about case formulation, who had proposed a model about case formulation. We were looking for people who had sort of... Uh, I'd say eat, drink, sleep, case for work. They're always thinking about it uh -huh. uh, and, and are writing about it and they're giving workshops about it and so forth. So this is a, you know, a relatively small group, but we wanted to get that, that group and compare their formulations to these other two groups. And what we did was a kind of um, rather intense exercise where we presented in one hour six vignettes the vignettes were uh, about two minutes in length and the therapist then had five minutes to formulate it and five and two minutes to develop a treatment plan and then we went on to the next one 
I, I, I'll never forget one of my uh, uh, therapists said this was the like the oral exam from hell. I mean, it was the, it, you know it was a fairly intense experience. So under that kind of pressure, we thought that 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 will help uh, discriminate the expert formulations from the uh, from those of the experienced folks and and the novices. So what did we find? We found, first of all, that on uh, qualities of, of uh, on ratings of quality of case formulation, the experts did quite a bit better. What do we mean by quality? First of all, they came up with a lot more ideas, all right, uh, than the other two groups. They simply were able to draw from a, uh, uh, I think, a deeper knowledge base in order to generate ideas about what may be causing and maintaining the problems in these particular individuals. Their formulations were more uh, specific, uh, tailored, if you will, to the individual case than the others. They were able to um, elaborate more. They drew more not only from uh, the research base, if you will, but they were able to tie that to the specifics of the case. So we looked at how well they drew or to what extent they drew inferences that were directly based on information or descriptive information, if you will, that was uh, presented in the vignette. They drew from that information much more than uh, than the other two groups, meaning to say that while they made you know formulation involves leaps of inference, okay, they made shorter term leaps and always grounded that in the uh, the the data, if you will, that was in the vignette itself. Yeah. They also tended to link their uh, treatment plans more closely to their formulations. And they followed a more systematic process. What I mean by that is, if you we we did we looked at their set of six formulations, and the uh, uh, experts were much more consistent in the 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 sort of uh, structure uh, the structure exactly uh -huh. of how they went about case formulation. Yeah, they had a kind of model in their head, and yeah. they applied. And that that heuristic helped them to organize information. Precisely. Okay. Uh -huh. So those were, you know, basically the the differences between the two. What we did not find, and this is an important point, uh -huh. is whether I mean we couldn't find this because we didn't even ask this question, is whether uh, a high quality case formulation predicts outcome. I mean that was just not part of the design of this study that's an important question that's a difficult question but it's an but it's a it's an important one to uh, to uh, uh, to research and i'd love to see more more come out in this area uh, actually that was exactly my next question that's like the million dollar question do we have any research suggesting that uh, a, a good solid case formulation can improve therapy outcomes in some way we um, we have a few studies. There's not a lot of studies. We've got some essentially correlational studies, and there's some a few randomized clinical trials. The randomized clinical trials, you know, generally uh, support the idea. And I have to say, I'm a slightly biased on this, but it's it's not. I think it I think it's a fair read of the data that there's not a lot of difference between a, if you will, a um, uh, therapy that is delivered according to a manualized approach mm -hmm. and one that is case formulation guided. Okay. There are some studies that show, you know, one doing better than the other. There's, for each one of those, you'll find one that's, that's, that, that shows the other way. Often when you look at outcome, uh, you know, out six, nine months after treatment, <clears throat> any differences go away. Yeah. In the correlational study, and Silber, George Silberschatz has done a lot of this work, they find they, they will track the patient's experience on a almost moment to moment, on an intervention to intervention basis mm -hmm. in response to statements that therapists make that are either consistent with a formulation mm 
or are inconsistent with the formulation. And what they have found across uh, several patients in single study, uh, single patient studies, that the when the intervention of the therapist is consistent with the formulation, that the patient's experience essentially sort of deepens, and they're becoming more engaged with the uh, with the uh, uh, you know with the therapy. And I believe George Silberschatz, uh, someone else you might want to speak to, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, is it's about exactly. to publish a study of I think 40 or 39, 40 patients that you know essentially show show this finding. I, I do want to mention a. Um, uh, you know, I, I published an article in uh, Pragmatic, uh, Pragmatic, uh, the journal on yeah. pragmatic studies, mm-hmm. uh, where I I uh, talked about what I call the case formulation hypothesis, mm-hmm. and this goes back to an article published in uh, American Psychologist back in 1991 by Jackie Persons, who uh, essentially said that uh, outcome studies uh, do not uh, directly study the theories that they purport to study, and she proposes the case formulation hypothesis is a kind of antidote to that. What I, uh, you know, in this uh, more recent article, I sort of revised that in light of recent developments in the field, and essentially proposed this hypothesis that, uh, uh, you know, that a case formulation guided therapy should either be equal to, I shouldn't say should, but the question is, does case formulation guided psychotherapy equal or exceed uh, the outcome of uh, sort of standard manual-based research? The implication of this in my mind is, if, if the null hypothesis is supported, that there's no difference, then all else being equal, there's no reason, uh, all else being equal, that's an important assumption, mm-hmm. there's no reason to support a uh, sort of manual-based therapy over a case formula, a evidence-based, again, yeah. case formulation approach that's tailored to the specific in a range of problems that a uh, that a patient presents with, From the and the research on this is, I would say, generally uh, supportive of this appro- of this hypothesis. Although I've not done a systematic uh, review of it. From from all the research you've been telling us about, it seems that maybe I don't know if you'd agree. I'd be curious if the some of the main effects of a good case formulation have to do with the formulation being a sort of mediator into other effects like better alliance, better empathy on part of the therapist. Right. So it's not the the formulation it, itself in a way; it's a mediator to other effects like right. goal consensus and these kind of things. Agreed, and one could develop a you know a mediator hypothesis. To, to test at, and there, there's at least one study I know that was done out of, I believe, New Zealand that did, uh, d- did show that, uh, that uh, the, 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 I believe it showed the quality of a case formulation, the use of a case formulation mm-hmm. uh, did predict outcome uh, as compared to therapists who uh, were less reliant on a formulation. The mechanism may be very much as you described. The, the challenge for research is that, you know, even with the manualized approaches, the therapists are formulating. I mean, we can't sort of help but, but formulate because, again, you're always, to some extent, tailoring the, mm-hmm. the uh, uh, you know, if you will, sort of the package, the manualized treatment to a specific individual. Yeah. So might as well make it explicit and work on it. Right. Through your extensive research and collaborations, you developed an integrative evidence-based case formulation model, and I'll put it now up on the screen. Uh, this model, it can be useful to practitioners of any theoretical background, correct? Yes. Mm-hmm. That's, my, that's, my, that's my claim. <laughs> <laughs> that's your goal and your claim. So would you right. mind walking us through this, in a way? So you, sure. s- you start off with uh, the gathering mm-hmm. of information? You know, basically, in a, I'd say even a simplistic way, um, you know, 
therapy essentially involves, uh, I'd say, three steps. You know, you gather information, four steps. You gather information, you formulate it in some way, either explicitly or implicitly, and that includes developing a you know, some idea about what you're going to do in the therapy, what your plan is, and then you treat. So you gather information, you formulate, you treat, you get feedback in some way, either, again, formally or informally. The cycle continues until you terminate. Patients better, they're not better. So what I want to do now is then sort of unpack, if you will, this second step, which is formulate. Mm -hmm. And what, what I did with a graduate student uh, uh, here at uh, University of Louisville is, this was back uh, many years ago, we looked at everything we could find on case formulation. We tried to identify common elements in all of these approaches. And we identified essentially, you know, and, and these steps that are laid out here in the graph reflect what we found. Where, you know, you start off with a problem list. The idea being that what you formulate is not the patient as a whole, you're formulating problems. Mm -hmm. okay? And then you diagnose. There are a lot of problems with diagnosis, and I get into this in the book, reliability being, being, being a huge one. But diagnosis is still useful in many ways, and I think it's very helpful to integrate a diagnosis into the case formulation process. Um, so you create a problem list, you use that to develop a diagnosis. Frankly, you kind of put the diagnosis aside to some extent, and then you develop a uh, explanatory hypothesis that aims to explain the problems that you've decided collaboratively, collaboratively with the patient mm -hmm. to work on in the therapy, and then you plan treatment based on that. Mm -hmm. Going a little bit back to the diagnosed part, uh, besides the reliability problems of categories like DSM, yeah, I remember that even in your book, the handbook, that Wes Greenberg and Rhonda Goldman, they talked about the emotion-focused case formulation process. Right. And their approach is a lot more moment-by-moment -moment process diagnosis. And right. they generally do away with the broader uh, person diagnosis. What's your right. take on that? Well, um, I, I think it is a, it's a clearly a distinctive approach. I think that we're all uh, focusing on these moment-to-moment -moment, uh, changes in what's going on in the therapy room. I think it, it offers a, uh, a uh, uh, again, I think I said, sort of distinctive approach. Um, I think that um, these patterns that are identified with uh, the emotion-focused approach do tend to repeat. They tend to be habitual. And as, there, as one can identify these habitual problems, these, you know, um, un the unfinished business, if you will, is uh, uh, one example of a category that you could use that as uh, those sorts of, to infer at, at the sort of the case level. Yeah. But, but I, I understand that and so I th certainly appreciate the value of being in the moment with the patient. And that's what those writers really focus on. That's, that's critically important. And it offers a, a, an important uh, uh, you know, focus for case formulation because one never wants to lose sight of that. I also think that uh, it's helpful to get this sort of case level view as well. Okay, I'm sorry I interrupted I you. They've moved somewhat in that. I think they've moved somewhat in that uh, direction, uh, sl at least to some degree in that direction as well. Yeah. In my, con I've had this conversation that you and I are now having with Les Greenberg mm -hmm. and and uh, Rhonda Goldman, one of his former students, and. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's where I, I get that from. So uh, I'm sorry I interrupted you before you were talking now about developing an explanatory hypothesis. Well, that part is really the approach part, right? Like how do we explain what causes what's happening? How to explain the problems. And so I will ask uh, students, uh, you know, what is the source of information? What do you draw upon when you're trying to understand a patient, uh, you know, a patient's problems. 
And I'll get a lot of different answers, of course, but they will range from, well, you know, we, we look at theory. We've learned a lot of theory. So we look at, you know, psychodynamic theory, cognitive behavioral theory. We'll look at, uh, like we were talking about, emotion-focused uh, theory. There's all sorts of theory. We'll look at uh, <coughs> attachment theory. Uh, look at behavioral theory. There's all sorts of theory, of course, one can draw upon. One can look at evidence, you know, evidence that supports theory. One can look at psychotherapy outcome studies, process outcome studies. Uh, one can uh, look at, um, uh, you know, what the patient is telling us, obviously, as a, as a source of, uh, of an explanation. So, um, A few people might be asking, so why choose one over the other? What's the criteria? Well, in my mind, the criteria is what works. What does the empirical evidence say works better for a, for a particular range of problems? <clears throat> I mean, my, my view would be, you know, if your approach is, uh, let's just say, if you're a psychodynamic psychotherapist and a patient presents with something like trichotillomania, mm -hmm. hair pulling, all right, and that's, that's what they've come to you with, that's what they want to work on. Mm -hmm. You know, we know there's a lot, there's, there are behavioral models that are effective for treating trichotillomania. Mm -hmm. What I would say, and I'm not aware, there might be, but I'm not aware of any psychodynamic research that supports uh, a psychodynamic approach to trichotillomania. I would say either learn and apply yeah. that approach or refer to someone. So again, to me, it's, it's all about what does the evidence say, yeah. not, not what, a, what a therapist might prefer to do or like to do one it's all about the patient of course so i think we all you and i and anyone listening to this understands it's, it's always really all about the patient and what's what's going to work uh most effectively and most really efficiently and quickly yeah one parallel question to this is that when people hear evidence based they usually assume cognitive therapy so is this a fair comparison Uh, not in my mind, okay, uh, because great. to me there's all sorts of evidence. You know, cognitive behavioral. Uh, there's a huge amount of evidence supporting cognitive behavioral treatment. There's evidence supporting psychodynamic treatment, mm -hmm. emotion focused treatment. There's there's a lot of evidence out there. This approach is very Catholic, if you will, <laughs> with a small C. You know that you know if you've got the evidence and if it is relevant to the problems that you are uh, that your patient is presenting with then use it yeah. apart from whatever theory might uh, uh, that evidence might might be drawn from and sometimes that's going to be uh, cognitive behavioral sometimes it'll be uh, the psychodynamic literature or some other literature yeah. and then from that you can plan the treatment like you're saying you can uh, see the reaction of the client this already maybe the reaction the feedback part is more on the treat uh, part of your model I'm not completely sure so you formulate and then you go to the session and you see how it works basically that's right you for you, you, you test it out yeah <laughs> I think that you know a test of a good um, uh, explanatory hypothesis is does it help or hurt or have no effect on the patient yeah. And that doesn't mean that you look for an, an immediate effect, uh, but uh, you do look for effects. And you can, when you're not finding, we know from Michael Lambert's research that when you're, you know, that the feedback, uh, that, that responding to feedback, uh, you know, gives you a boost in outcome. So, uh, you're yes, absolutely right. You, you you develop the treatment plan, and I've got an empirically supported approach to developing a treatment plan where you look uh, I mean there's a focus on goals short term and long term but it starts off with a, a kind of assessment I call it the patient's a set point for therapy it is sort of where they're um, starting from and we look at um, various uh, dimensions if you will process dimensions that we know when we consider these have uh, influence on outcomes. So, you know, one of these is you look at the patient's level of reactance. Mm -hmm. 
to what extent do they value autonomy to what extent are they willing to take if you will direction or intervention from the therapist we know that if the therapist um, uh, complements the patient's uh, level of reactance which you can assess relatively quickly mm -hmm. in a therapy session that that's going to give you a boost uh, to outcome same with consideration of a patient's uh, preferences even if you cannot accommodate those preferences if you uh, discuss them with the patient, then we know that there's a, a contribution to outcome. And then I would say with cult, look at the patient's culture, mm -hmm. background, and then look at, think about their uh, sort of readiness for treatment yeah. so before you get into the identification process and outcome goals. These are the client's characteristics. It's like those uh, John Norcross said it, the responsiveness markers. Uh, Larry Butler's work on reactants. So these are the folks I, I, I drew from in identifying these uh, variables for uh, developing a treatment plan. The, the other thing about this is, you know, someone looking at this uh, figure might think, oh my gosh, this is too, so complicated. Um, you know, and um, it doesn't have to be complicated. I, I think that case formulation is more than anything else a kind of, if you will, mental state. It's an approach, it's a framework for thinking about uh, the patients that you're seeing. It does not require a, you know, three, five, ten page written document that lays everything out here. Uh, what it does require, though, is the therapist to sort of think in terms of these categories, to think empirically, and it's a tool, again, to organize this information. And, and so skill. I wouldn't want someone yeah. looking at this to think, you know, <laughs> I just don't have time for that because as I've said, I'm a practicing clinician. I know what it's like to have to move very quickly from one individual to the next. Yeah. And it's a skill that can be trained also. We know that. We've got some data to show that with uh, Ed Kangelic and I did a did a study where we showed uh, you know pretty good uh, uh, effectiveness of a relatively brief uh, training yeah. uh, in case formulation. This is your 2007 we, we, paper, I believe. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I, I thank you for being so up to date on my research. <laughs> no, it's very interesting. I'm impressed. But Tracy. Uh, Someone's reading it. Ah, uh, for sure. It, really, it is because I think this is, a, like we said in the beginning, maybe not undervalued but sometimes understudied phenomenon. So it's very nice to have a chance to talk to you about this. Just finishing off, I'm sorry we kind of jumped through your own model, but people interested in it, I would really highly recommend to check out your APA book and your handbook on case formulation. Let me add on the handbook, um, I'm talking with Guilford about a third edition, so we hope to get that out uh, maybe uh, maybe in 2018 or so. So that'll be, a we hope, another uh, uh, kind of an important update on uh on the research and thinking in, in, in case formulation. So that's a heads up for our listeners also. I'd like to leave you with one, with one last question that I've been asking all of our colleagues, which is when you were starting out as a psychotherapist, what advice would you wish to have received? What advice would I wish I received? I got such wonderful advice that I can't think anyone left anything out. You know, I, I had face-to-face -face, uh, individual supervision for eight years plus, and I learned so much from that. Um, and I, you know, I that's such a hard question for me because I got um, I, I got such wonderful advice. I can I w if I can. I could, I, if I could answer a different question, what advice would you leave? Uh, uh, let, me, let me let me highlight some of the things that immediately come to mind that people did say to me, mm -hmm. and this one one point in particular comes out, <clears throat> and my entire thinking about <clears throat> case formulation in some sense revolves around this uh, this point. And this uh, this supervisor said to me, the the most important thing for a therapist is to stay in the room with the patient to stay in the room with the patient and that obviously means not just physically staying in the room with the patient but for but staying in the room with your entire humanity as an individual 
uh, with all of your knowledge, all of your expertise, to be able to tolerate, if you will, and accept the extraordinarily painful things that patients tell us. To be able to stay in the room with the, the, the patient, I think, uh, was the best advice I've gotten. So I think that's should... what I try to do, and I it's a challenge every every, every day. Yeah. So not use case formulation as a guard against the patient. Also, <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you added that. Do not use formulation as a shield. Use it as a uh, as a as a facilitator. <laughs> staying in the room with the patient. The collaborative co-construction we were talking about. Right. Tracy, right. thank you so much for the opportunity of talking. It's been great fun, Alexander. I appreciate the opportunity.